you know, in science, it's very black and white. You have a theory, it's either right or wrong, right? In trading, you know, I mean, you can be right. It's, it's more probability uh, and kind of, uh, you know, run over 10 or 100 different times you do that, you know? You know, trading, you're never going to be right 100% of the time, never, ever. I mean, you know, and, and I think being right 50% 50, 50 of the time, you can still make good money, you know, if it's about how you trade it when you when you get it right and how you trade it when you get it wrong. And that's really a lot of, I think, the, the lessons of actually the experience I've got, garnered from career in trading is that, it, you know, you need to think about things over the medium term and the number of times you try a strategy out uh, rather than just, you know, something. There's no, there's no, there's no one trick that's going to work every single time. Welcome to this week's AFMIND podcast, where we chat with Clive Ponsonby, who, after graduating from Cambridge University with a maths degree, took a daring leap into the wild world of spot foreign exchange trading in the 1990s. This was a time where the world of FX trading was dominated by streetwise and quick-witted traders, most of whom did not hail from academic backgrounds. Over the next couple of decades, Clive secured positions at top investment banks, starting at Bankers Trust, and later move into UBS and JP Morgan, where he served as an executive director of FX Trading until 2018, running a large team of traders spread out across the global markets. In this interview, Clive shares valuable insights into the challenges of effectively using and applying analysis of all types in your work as a trader. Clive continues to trade for himself today and also provides exceptional research on trading and markets as a currency fella at Header, a platform known for world-class quality research which is available to professional retail traders as well as institutional traders. You can find out more about Header on the show notes for this week's episode. The AFMIND podcast is sponsored by the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. The STA are the world's leading body for the advancement of technical analysis and run fantastic education programs, diplomas, meetings and conferences on themes connected to technical analysis and trading price action. You can find out more about them on their website, technicalanalysts.com. As our sponsoring partner, the STA are delighted to offer listeners of the AFMIND podcast a discount on their outstanding STA Home Study Course and STA Home Study Course and Diploma Program. You can find out details about this by going to the AFMIND blog, which you can find at alphamindblog.blogspot.com or just Googling AFMIND blog and then go to the link STA Home Study Course at the top of the page. Now on with this week's podcast. We're delighted to have Clive Ponsonby with us, currently a Forex Fellow at Header and author of the monthly series Currency View, which we understand is very well read and uh, uh, highly regarded across the industry. He has over 20 years experience in foreign exchange trading and the associated risk management market making in G10 as part of that story um, for the emerging markets area particularly. Previously at foreign exchange trader at JP Morgan Chase and was re responsible for spot forwards, non-deliverable forwards and rate products for the bank leading a global team in various time zones. Um, he began his career in um, UBS from a foreign exchange point of view, again in the emerging markets area, and ultimately went out to uh, run the uh, Asian FX team at JP Morgan as well. So lots of, of background there that we want to dig into. Um, he's also a foreign exchange consultant, by the way, advising clients on managing FX. So I think we're going to hear some of that story evolve as we go through today. But um, I just want to head over to Clive, really, and sort of ask that question that we ask many of our guests on the podcast. Sort of, so where did it all begin? At what point did it start to make sense for you in terms of you sort of finding this uh, um, niche in ultimately ended up in what you're doing, which is more of a macro sense. Where, where was the starting point for you, Clive? Well, I think, um, hi, thanks for having me on the show, by the way. It's uh, nice to speak to you guys. Um, I think it kind of all happens a little bit, not by not by design, more by kind of serendipitous accident um, as much as anything else. Um, I was at university, uh, Cambridge, and all of the the people who were going into these kind of high-powered careers, it was management consultancy or banking were the two kind of main options people were going into unless they were staying on in academia. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time, you, the, way, the way you 
got into the industry was uh, doing an internship, normally in your penultimate year, penultimate summer, and then uh, you applied for things. Um, and I was kind of a, a, a maths geek, I'd probably best best describe it. You know, I was doing maths at Cambridge. It was a very uh, academic uh, viewpoint, not really a kind of a street smart kind of subject. Um, and, you know, so ending up on the FX spot desk, which is kind of almost the antithesis of this in kind of 1990s trading environment in a bank was um, a kind of happy accident in a way. Um, so, you know, I did um, internship which at a Bankers Trust, which um, is long gone, absorbed into Deutsche and then various other places. But they were a bit of a, a trader's bank at the time, um, quite well known. And I was uh, doing kind of a mathematical modeling research on the side of the trading floor um, and uh, you know, working with spreadsheets, writing macros and this kind of stuff. And we're actually kind of coming up with a, a new, uh, a slightly more accurate options pricing model because as you probably know, Black Shoals is very, doesn't really describe the reality of markets. We were trying to improve on it basically and um, in a way that could actually be, you know, have a closed form solution and this kind of stuff. And they were fitting, fitting the data to markets. But, you know, being on the edge of the floor, we were able to kind of, talked to some of the traders and it was, it was fabulous. You had the noise and the buzz on the floor, you know. I remember, you know, uh, non-farm payrolls, the big, big economic number of the month, you know, on Friday, first Friday of the month. And uh, you know, I just remember, you know, hearing that everything go quiet and then you would hear out of one of the, probably one of the broker boxes at the time, but it was some of the speakers have been like the, someone was playing like the ride of the Valkyries in like the 30 seconds kind of coming up to the number coming out because everyone would, you know, just be waiting for this thing. And then it would just be, you know, carnage and just noise, a, a wall of noise, and everyone's shouting to get attention and, you know, mind yours, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it was just, you know, I asked to spend a week, uh, my last week um, with one of the traders. Um, and I sat on the equity derivatives trading desk and uh, you know, got to experience some of just the buzz and, you know, just knew this is, this is, this is what I want to do, you know. Um, this is much more, much more fun, much more, uh, much more going on, much more exciting. And this is what you kind of used to see. It kind of almost felt a little bit like an evolution of like the, the, the kind of floor trading you used to see on kind of the 80s and, you know, things like, you know, uh, you know some of, the, some of the, the films you used to see. And it's kind of, um, it, it just, you know, that's what I wanted to do. So, um, you know, then, you know, you go through the application process the following year. And, uh, you know, I applied, the, the place I'd worked at, they wanted me to do like a mathematical modeling thing. Again, they, were, they, they liked what I did, but they didn't want me on the trading floor. Um, and I kind of turned that down. And it was kind of a bit of a happy accident in a way. I ended up on spot trading. Um, back in those days, you had to do a, there was no online kind of testing. You had to do a, you turn up in person to do a numeracy test before they even considered you. So, you know, I popped on the train down to London in some kind of hotel conference room. And there was, you know, maybe 150, 200 people all sitting in this kind of multiple choice kind of maths test. And, you know, obviously maths, uh, this was the theory of walking the park for me. I was, wasn't expecting it to be a problem. Um, I did maybe five or six of these things through various applications. And um, I, I'd done one uh, a few weeks before the one I did for, for, for UBS. And, uh, and, and the biggest problem I had with it was actually finishing it in time because they obviously put quite a lot of questions, actually not expecting people to finish them to, to really differentiate the top end. Um, and I didn't finish it. But, you know, I still got the letter th through saying, oh, you passed the university test, come to interview you in, in, yeah, in three weeks' time or whatever. So doing this next one, I thought, right, well, okay, I've got to, got to do this fast. That's, my, that's the biggest uh, limitation here. So, you know, I kind of gave myself 45 seconds per question, rattled them off, um, you know, stopped on a few, left a few behind and said, you know, right, okay, I'll come back to those at the end if I've got time. Um, and then, you know, ended up, you know, able to go back, finish the ones, go through and check everything, finish it, still had a few minutes left. And I was like, okay, I've aced this, you know. So um, go back to, you know, back up on the train. Uh, a couple of days later, a letter comes through the post. Sorry, you failed to pass the numeracy test. Um, you know, the high colour of candidates, you know, no, no, no longer uh, taking your application forward at this time. And I <laughs> almost laughed at this. I was like, there's, there's a mistake. So I rang them up, actually rang up the HR department and said, you've made a mistake. You've sent me through this letter saying I failed the Lucia test. I did fail that test. I, I passed it with flying colours. You, know, you, you go back and check. And they're like, no, 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 sorry. You know, it's all computer marked. You know, it's all, you know, you didn't, didn't get enough results. I no, 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 check again, check again. And they, um, what they've done was the, the results were all truncated as a percentile. 
and it was um, just truncated to two des- two, the last two figures. So uh, when I got 100, it just appeared as zero, zero on their, on their things. So, um, yes, yeah, so they, they <laughs> rang back a couple of days later and said, oh, yes, sorry, we did make a mistake. Can you come in to interview, you know, tomorrow <laughs> or whatever? Um, and I think that was really what got me onto this kind of, onto the to kind of more um, kind of old-fashioned desk in a way, because they saw some someone that was smart but also had guts to kind of question things and actually call them out on it. And, um, you know, so I joined a desk, which was about 30 odd people at the time. And I was the only, I was the second graduate on the desk and the only other one was the guy that joined a year beforehand. And most people left school at 16, you know, they'd learned through the school of hard knocks and, you know, kind of often gone through back office jobs or from broken, broken side to, um, to trading. Um, and, uh, you know, it was all kind of gut feeling and, you know, mind yours and shouting and, you know, kind of very much feel for things rather than kind of any kind of analysis. So I was very much a... Uh, uh, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole at the desk in some ways. But I think because of the way things evolved, I was actually one of the perfect fits because I was able to then, you know, I had this kind of, I had to learn how to do this, which is very much not my comfort zone, um, how to trade in a market where it is just you against everyone else. Um, but then, you know, also as things evolved to become much more, you know, when you, you know, we moved to much more electronic trading and things like this, um, and as we moved to AI and algos and, you know, it, it, it could, the way trading happened completely evolved from paper tickets to kind of you know algorithmic algos and AI. So you know it's um, nice to have been probably in, in exactly the right place at the right time in a way. Yes, I think if uh, Steve and I had to pass the maths test to get into the city, we probably wouldn't be in the city. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably most well, of well, what I work with. Well, it's not true, Mark. I did have a minor math test when I joined, but it was in a pub. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, this guy can add up, give him the job. And that was <laughs> that was an ages type of interview. <laughs> uh, different. Yeah, but horses for courses. And of course, we, we need the um, huge variety, don't we, in, the, in, the, in these ecosystems of trading to, to, co- to cover the various different lenses i think that's the, that's the key thing you need lots of different styles of trading you know uh, to make to make a desk work you, you, if everyone trades the same way it's just you know everything's going to be correlated you know you need 10 different traders doing so, 10 different things to make a balanced desk well, well indeed and, and, and perhaps i've got a question for you and, and into that I, I guess i want to find that sort of nugget of, of, from you in terms of when you started to make sense of things the, what sort of process were you going through to make sense of things in that in, in what analytics means to you i think it's because of course yeah, we've got an audience that a lot of are, are trying to maybe work some ideas out for themselves so it's a process that i'm quite interested in for you to reveal here i mean so i'm on the autistic spectrum so my whole life has been trying to fit rules to 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 different situations um uh, and you know, trying to work out what people are doing and how they how they do it was you know, it's, it's always been a bit of a challenge. But I've always therefore been you know, coming up with rules uh, of how things work, uh, writing down you know all the data I can you know to try and to try to recreate how other people do things. Um, and so you know, when it came to you know financial markets, I thought this is ideally suited for this. You know, it, it should be following some kind of rules. I mean, I found out that you know it wasn't quite as uh, uh, logical or following rules in terms of market moving, you know, there's a lot of a lot of random noise uh, within that, and that's actually where a lot of the value is as well. Um, but really, I, I, I watched what other people did, and I asked them to, you know, explain how how they traded, how they did it, and it's quite hard for a lot of people to actually put that down into words of you know the, the style and how they make their decisions. But that's very much what I was, what I was digging down to, and I think. Um, you know, I, I tried different things out for myself, and you know, trying and failing, I think, is uh, is is one of the best teachers. Um, but I think as well, you know, I think that's the lesson that people can learn when they're trying to trade. You can f- try and follow what other people are doing, but it'd be very hard to, um, uh, to 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 copy someone's style exactly. And I think you do just have to kind of try a few different things on for yourself and see what works for you. And when you find something that works, then I think that's. Uh, that's what that's what you know, it's what works for you and i think there's as many you know, for every trader everything's going to be slightly different how they make their decisions how they come up to that 
Um, and some people would be very much just gut feeling. They would just be, you know, uh, get a feel for just from price action. Um, it's a very powerful indicator. But it's really hard to describe to someone what, what price action is and how to kind of look at that and uh, take cues from that. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people would then look at technical analysis to give them a kind of framework to analyze this. And in some ways, that's what I think see technical analysis as, is kind of a way of describing kind of the human price action that's go, that goes into a market uh, and come up with a set of rules uh, from that, you know, to kind of encapsulate when, when something's, you know, getting to a level which is a bit sticky and won't, will take a bit more to get through. So I think, you know, and I think that's where, you know, for my own trading now, um, I'm much more kind of multi-day, multi-month or multi-week, multi-month type views rather than kind of intraday stuff. And I think uh, that's where, you know, I think, yeah, it's one of the first places you should start is just look at look at a chart from uh, from what you're trying to trade and just kind of, you can see a few cues from that. It doesn't take much to do that. But really just uh, my, my, my general... Uh, stuff i don't get too involved in it but i'll look at uh, i'll draw lots of straight lines on charts you know trend line supports previous highs previous lows that kind of stuff as levels to watch out for um and i think there's a lot of people uh who i worked with who were very skeptical of technical analysis you know they would um but i think it's one of those things where it has a certain critical mass of people who who believe it that it actually then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy you know if enough people think that if level, you know, if the 80 level goes in this whatever product, it's going to gap higher, then, you know, a lot of people will leave their stops and trade accordingly if the 80 level does go. So, you know, almost and the, the act of these people buying on that break will actually mean that it will do that. So even if you uh, don't understand technical analysis or don't see why it should work, I think it's something that you have to be looking at and taking some cues from. Um, and it's a very good way of picking a stop loss, you know, when, you know, the first thing any trader should be doing when you enter a position is knowing where your stop loss is. Um, and I think it's good to just to sometimes zoom out and uh, take a look where, where, where you're wrong. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Clive. And, um, and again, w welcome to the show on, on my behalf. And thank you for that fantastic introduction. Um, I'm going to just follow up on a couple of points you said there. Um, I love the idea of technical analysis as a framework. Um, and there's lots of different, you know, philosophies of how to use an analysis, how to apply analysis. Um, and, and I think we all kind of have a, a, a natural draw to fundamental analysis because it kind of fits in with, I think, how we learn generally when we're young, that there's a story, an explanation, a theory, um, and and you know, a rationale for that. Whereas technical analysis challenges a lot of people because it's, you know, that th there is not always a story there. I mean, we can build a story around the price action, um, but it, it, it doesn't always fit naturally. And I remember when I first got introduced to technical analysis as a trader back in the 90s, that I, I was instantly very sceptical and at the same time instantly hooked on how you know, it suddenly seems to also that, that there's something there. Um, and I remember being um, a trader, I was at Credit Suisse at the time, and we, we had a couple of really good technical analyst, analysts. Um, but the traders sort of took no real interest in in what she said. Um, there was a couple of them, uh, they were both, both women at the time. But what they said might be a better explanation. And yet I noticed how often at key turning points they were right. Um, so there was definitely something there that got my attention. And I think that's kind of what it is. It captures the sentiment in the market. Maybe when, when there's too many buyers or too many sellers, even if it's a story that is going higher, it gives you that sense of a market just has too many people long here. And it, it needs to, you know, sort of, it needs to have a bit of a clear out was how they used to describe it. A sell off before it can go up again. Um, yeah, when you look at things like RSI, you know, they're trying to yeah. capsulate that that kind of idea, you know. Yeah, but you could always see that in the price action. I mean, we we were always told look at the secondary indicator, and I I sometimes got overly hooked on the the secondary indicators, 
And actually, you can just see that in the price action as it kind of fades away and it, it stops making each high is a little bit, got a little bit less behind it. Um, but it keeps rolling higher and then eventually it breaks and it falls away. And you often see that that is what you see in the RSI or the MACD or the other momentum indicators. Yeah. But, I think I think it's um it, it's interesting. We 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 often you know I think particularly nowadays in FX markets, uh, it used to be much more gradual the moves. You tend to get markets just kind of uh, gap from one level to the next level, and then they'll kind of stay in a zone for 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 minutes or hours, and then they'll kind of gap again, you know, to the next one. This you know I, I remember you know when I was trading earlier you could get onto a move much more easily when you could see something kind of starting to move, a bit of momentum going. It's very easy to get on the back of that. Now it's much, much harder. It kind of just seems to, that 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 move just happens almost instantaneously and adjusts to the new, you know, to the new, uh, whatever the new level's going to be. Um, and I think, you know, in a way, you know, these indicators give you a, a sense of, kind of encapsulating the kind of, because it gaps to a level, you suddenly find liquidity. If, if it's going up, it suddenly finds a wave of sellers and that will absorb all of the buying demand that was there to take us to that point. And then unless there's new buying demand, it's going to run out of steam and then it's probably likely to come off, you know? Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting, I'm, I'm, Genesis, isn't it? I guess, I guess just to sort of reflect back on, so I remember back in sort of 82 on, you know, the initial days of the live trading floor as a as a pit trader um as a non-mathematician just to re-emphasize that point um but this chap turned up from chicago and i just started that this guy was drawing pictures and i was my art side of my mind because well, that's interesting there's somebody creating art of the movement and the pulse of the market and i got really and that that was very attractive to me to start to look at a market from a artistic or spatial awareness point of view and we're still quite you know relatively young in my crib being actually have to actually have a pretty sensible view about things um and a sense of direction um that, that ended up becoming sort of quite a popular reuters page as we, we we turned to reuters to put these things out um but it was it was the, the fact that it was almost a release you know that the, the the, the technical, heavy, numeric environment that you sat within, and sort of the sort of the charting or technical analysis was sort of a release to just observe things in a, I don't know, just, just a way that connected with me, and I could connect with it and then share it in a language that people understood. So it became like a communication device and the sort of a credibility thing, as well. And and I'm really interested to hear how your mathematical mindset was also dealing with perhaps an artistic mindset of technicals as well. Did you see it as something that gave you another dimension that perhaps wasn't so clear in the mathematical world? I think it, it's interesting. I mean, just looking at a looking at a chart, which is trying to, a lot of the time, you know, some of these indicators that are trying to encapsulate the price action. I always felt that actually living the price action and, you know, hearing it and you know, kind of the, the connection when you're trading every pit in the market gave you a better sense of that than a, than a chart could ever do. But what I found really interesting, you know, as, as, as the technical analysis seemed to evolve, you would get all these kind of, I mean, uh, I could throw in all sorts of examples, but you know, like DMARC indicators and you, know, you get these kind of like Elliott waves where, where it kind of was, it becomes predictive. You know, it's predicting that if it does this, you know, if it makes this kind of pattern, then this kind of pattern is going to, you know, follow from it, um, and I find that I found that really uh, uh, interesting. Again, more from a um, not so much thinking about it artistically, thinking about it as being some way of almost like a model that's uh, a computer model that's kind of found out uh, what you know, spitting out the right answer of what the next thing's going to be. Um, Almost like I mean, before we had the, the the concept of AI, almost what I, you know, kind of AI would would tell you what's going to happen next, you know, like predicting weather. Um, and I think uh, th these things really interested me, and I kind of, but a lot of them, it's very easy to fit to look back and fit a pattern to what's happened in the past. Uh, and when you're actually in the moment, seeing seeing a a pattern play out in real time, 
is much, much harder and it's much less clear. It's really easy when they show you examples of these uh, these patterns playing out. And yes, if you know this at this point this predicted this and then it actually happened and you know you can see it happen. But it really takes a real leap of faith to then actually trade on the back of that when it hasn't played out yet. Um, and I think I mean that was what really got me interested in, in in kind of delving a bit deeper into this stuff because I think as I say a lot of a lot of it I felt that the that the price action was 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 understood better by living it than uh, than kind of looking at it on a on a chart. But I think actually when it becomes predictive and these predictions have some value, then it's uh, really powerful and it's something which you can't then ignore. You know, you can't just say, oh, I know I know more than this. You know, um, I think maybe because of my maths background, I did have a have a have a feeling that there was some deeper meaning to these numbers that were flashing up on screens all the time, you know, um, there was some kind of meaning, you know, you wanted to believe there was a meaning to it. So I was maybe more, more able to be more a willing convert to this kind of stuff than maybe some other people. I guess Fibonacci probably would have helped you out there slightly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting um, turn of phrase when, when you say leap of faith. Um, how is a mathematician, or how does that fit in with a mathematician's mindset? Well, I mean, a lot of maths in, you know, you know, physics example, you know, the way to test it, you come up with a theory, and then you make a prediction that hasn't happened yet, and you see if it happens when you when it when you put those conditions at play. Um, a lot of science, in particular, not so much maths, but is is about making predictions and then seeing how they how they play out. So yeah. it very much is is is. Yeah, appeals to my my kind of the, the scientific mindset, uh, scientific method of of coming up with a theory, making a prediction, and seeing how that plays out, and you know taking that leap of faith that you're you're gonna you believe that your theory is right. But yeah, I, th I think that's the the hard thing about that when you uh, compare those two things, though, is you know in, in science it's very black and white. You have a theory, it's either right or wrong, right? In trading, you know, I mean, <laughs> you can be right. It's it's more probability. Uh, and kind of uh, you know run over ten or a hundred different times you do that you know you know trading you're never going to be right one hundred percent of the time never ever I mean you know and and I think being right fifty percent of the time you can still make good money you know if it's about how you trade it when you when you get it right and how you trade it when you get it wrong um, and you know uh, uh, you know th this could be a useful predictor but it's never going to be right one hundred percent of the time um, and really you have to. And that's where it is a leap of faith, I think, as much as anything else, because you have to have the faith that when it goes wrong, it's not, it doesn't mean you should immediately junk it because, you know, the best traders are only right, you know, if you could be a good trader and be right 50% of the time. Uh, it's how you trade it when you're right and how you trade it when you're wrong that makes the difference. And the best traders I knew would be, you know, at best getting it right 60% of the time. So, you know, it's it, it, every, every, uh, you know, thing even if it's perfect is going to come up with wrong answers in in trading uh, a lot of the time, and that's where you have to have persistence and think about it over the over a series of you know ten or a hundred trades rather than just one one trade. If it goes wrong, ignore that one and move on. Um, and that's really a lot of I think the the lessons of actually experience I've got garnered from a long career in trading is that it, you know. You need to think about things over the medium term and the number of times you try a strategy out, uh, rather than just you know something. There's not there's no there's no one trick that's going to work every single time. That's hence our catchphrase we 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 say often: next to thousand trades, yeah, not next one trade. Um, but li listen, this this has been great. Um, I got a question I want to ask you. Before I do, I have to come back to something you said at the very beginning, because. Uh, non-farm payroll day i'm not sure there's anything quite in the world that prepares you for that when you're in a trading room or on a trading floor for your very first non-farm payroll day it is quite a moment <laughs> and and you reminded me of that and then you talked about the ride to the valkyries now i i don't know if you've triggered something in my memory but i'm sure i remember hearing that playing over the uh the speakers um at some point on my on our spot desk in the distance but i, I maybe i want to believe that's what happened but it, it was just such an incredibly vibrant moment everything came down everything came down to that one point the room went to a hush and then the number came out 
and then it just exploded in ways that you just you almost can't describe and and you felt that hooked you was that what you said that was it yeah i mean just it was the buzz and the noise and the adrenaline you know of, of, of that that kind of uh environment was just it was it was it was uh intoxicating the yes. best way to describe it it was just um just a you know visceral nature of it as well it's just but it's, it's brutal as well i think you know the other thing that really kind of a, attracted me to it was the fact that it was a real almost meritocracy you know as a trader everyone can see exactly how you're doing on a daily basis a weekly basis a monthly basis there's no hiding you know um you know you might have a, a slightly better seat if you're a market maker you know to do things but everyone can still see how you're doing relative to the guy that did it last year or the year before you know there's a you know there's a real sense of you know, there's no hiding place. Um, and therefore, you know, if you if you back yourself and you think you are good, you know, you've got good ideas, then then you can rise very, very quickly. Um, it's funny, it's, um, you know, the noise of a trading floor is very much one of those things that's, that's kind of gone away, you know, over the years. And uh, I remember, you know, when I, when I, when I kind of left uh, in 2018, you know, they, one of the comments was it's going to be a lot quieter around here with you gone because I was still slightly old fashioned. When, when something was going on, I'd be shouting out, you know, um, you know, I'd be shouting out, you know, this is happening. And you know, a lot of people would be like posting messages onto Bloomberg chats, which go out to all the salespeople rather well, than actually standing up and shouting. But I was kind of like, you know, that was what I was brought up in. You know, people would shout when something interesting was going on. And it's, it's funny, I remember um, uh, there was a day in, uh, I think it was early early 2014 or 2015 yeah t- early 2015 when the euro swiss floor went oh god no yeah. swiss the yeah. snb yeah. been... sorry january the 15th if i exactly exactly yeah. um and uh they've been holding holding euro swiss above 120 for, for for months um and then they just let it go one morning and uh and it was one of those things where because obviously everything was on, on, on the, the G10 side, it was all electronic trading at that stage. And it, it dumped from 120. I mean, people thought if it goes, it would go down to like one, 110, maybe, you know, like a 10% move. That was kind of yeah. a, a big move in those days. And the thing went down to the 70s. You know, it dropped like 40% in, in, in minutes. Um, and the guys who were actually um, trading the, 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 the Swiss and and the euro, all the, kind of the G10 trades, I was doing uh, Asian EM at the time, um, they couldn't put bids and offers in because because it needed the big figure. And because the thing was like five big figures wide, the price was five big figures wide, th- their systems wouldn't let them do it. And they, they weren't used to having to put big figures in. But I was trading EM, I had to put big figures in all the time. So when I actually saw it, you know, and I, I bought some, it's my, um, one of my, 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 my quickest, quickest million <laughs> in trading. <laughs> Um, I, you know, having seen it kind of base in the high seventies and then go back up, I bought, I bought 10 at 89, 89 figure that is, um, cause it was just trading in big figures. There was no, no one was trading anything less than that. Um, and literally two minutes later, I sold five at 98 so almost 10% higher. Uh, and it was the five I sold was to the SMB, Swiss National Bank. So having, so I was then shouting out, the SMB is intervening, you know, and, I, and it was like, again, yeah, it's, um, uh, as I did in those days, I was the one shouting it out, and and yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the Euro trader or the Swiss trader, you know, who knew what was going on. I was the one that knew what was going on because I was um, and I was shouting out about it. Again, it was up. Yeah, you know, one minute later, I was selling my balance at one hundred four, so it went from eighty nine to one hundred four in three minutes, uh, and I made about you know twelve thirteen percent. We will return to this fascinating podcast shortly. If you are planning to upskill yourself as a trader or an analyst, or want to improve your chances of landing a job in the finance industry, the STA Home Study course may be what you are looking for. Developed by many of the leading minds in technical analysis and based on the STA's diploma program that was delivered at the London School of Economics, this course may be ideal for you. AlphaMind listeners can obtain a discount on the cost of this course. To find out more about this offer, Google AlphaMind blog or go to alphaMindblog.blogspot.com and hit the STA Study Course tab at the top of the screen. Now back to the podcast. Wow. And, and, and I'm so glad you've said this for personal reasons. Okay. And I'm going to put this out there now. And maybe you can back me up. Okay. I, I've just written a book. Okay. I've mentioned it a couple of times before on this podcast. 
Um, it's going to be out in January. It's called Mastering the Mental Game of Trading. Okay. And in it, I talk about that day. Now, I wasn't actually trading anymore on that day. Um, but, I, you know, if you've ever been in the FX markets, you will know about that day. And I know some clients who traded through that day. And so I've got one of their stories, which I've shared in the book, um, which is actually a good story. But um, I recall that the prices traded much lower than they were actually ever registered and are registered anywhere on any chart system. And I think you've just verified that for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was, I can remember, I remember uh, yeah, there's certain days that edge, etched onto your memory as a trader. Uh, yeah. And, and I, it, it was, it traded a few times in the 78, 77, 78. It did actually print on EBS, which was the, the main electronic um, uh, venue for, for Swiss trading at 0. 0.0001. Wow, uh, which was cancelled. Obviously, you know that we, yeah. we, we, we would check, but it, it traded. It traded several times below eighty, uh, yeah. but not. But you know, maybe five, five, six, seven times. You know, uh, but there were plenty of trades in the low eighties, eighty to eighty-three, and it was when it kind of turned back up. That's when I, you know, it's kind of. I think I think when I bought the ten eighty-nine, it was eighty-four, eighty-nine. I just went for mine. You know, so I'm so I'm so pleased you said this because I mean the system I'm looking at now at this point has the low at 0.85 and I, I wrote in a book that you know the, the low is much lower than it is on any systems um, and why that's important is anyone who now decides to build a system that looks back at the price action of euro swiss they're going to base it off that 85 low yeah, and, I, I, I can tell you it was lower than that yeah yeah so i mean this this becomes a problem yeah of course for any, anyone who does system and this is a problem for any, well, it, you know, for anyone who uses past data for a trading system. And, you know, obviously that's another form of analysis it is, you know, looking back at old data and then building future future trading systems based on them. Often the, the data for illiquid, illiquid per, periods is rarely up to date on the system. And, and we're talking about Euro Swiss as possibly the most liquid or one of the most liquid currency pairs ever. Through history, yeah, and I mean, I, I, having trading EM, getting accurate highs and lows was a was a really important thing because clients would want to know what 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 stuff. And again, there was a it wasn't an exact science, and and then there used to be you know there was all sorts of um, arcane things about when options had been you know agreed to be knocked out or not be knocked out, where about the barrier triggered, and there's all sorts of things. And I think it's funny because you know at that point. You know, there was still one primary dealing location where where a good you know eighty percent of the trades went through. Um, but now there's so much goes through on kind of individual individual kind of proprietary bank systems. You know, there's huge volumes going through the big two or three banks. You know, th their systems turn over more than EBS does. You know, which is which is the main interbank interbank um, electronic system but there's also many more competitors as well um and so you know it becomes much harder to say well what has traded you know now yeah. than, it, than it was even even you know back in 2015. yeah no no that's brilliant that's great. i think it's add to that though that um you know there is this other type of risk if you're building systems and in, in as much as that um the, the exchanges have the power to cancel trades below a certain level or above a certain level in these types of um you know black black swan type type events um and sometimes there's a real delay in understanding that your trade has been uh, been deleted by by the exchange uh and we've saw huge problems in the past where people you know try to take advantage of a, a you know perhaps a four standard deviation move in the market where things have gone bananas only to find that they put one trade on, sold it, pulled it back at a lower level to find out that their uh, their, their purchase had been cancelled because it was beyond the threshold point. Uh, but the market had gone way above their sell point by the time they got advised by the exchange that the purchase was uh, was deleted. So so there are some, you know, I know that the, the charts tell you something, but they don't tell you everything of these stories and that there are 
there are different types of casualties in these events. I mean, I, well, we've I, seen this very recently with the nickel market yeah. on the LME, right? They cancelled the whole day. Well, exactly. Yeah. Chaos. yeah. Uh, creates absolute chaos. And of course, you can't model for that. Um, but to know that sometimes it might happen perhaps does allow, that does make you um, perhaps not get quite so cocky about modeling, you know, because you, you've got to bear, bear in mind if there is suddenly a movement that is a four standard deviation movement, it might not be as good as it seems when it's on board as a, as a, as a piece of risk, um, because there's the other risk in the background that it may not be a position at all because it may get cancelled. I mean, the worst trade I've ever seen ever in my entire career was actually a non-farm payroll trade by somebody that ran about a 10 billion euro portfolio, decided to get a bit cocky and put, uh, I thought, oh, you know, payroll, it goes up, it goes down. Let's just put these things in. So 30 seconds pre-payroll is giving me orders. So you put a buy stop above the market with a take profit, half a point above that in US treasuries. And um, about 10 ticks below the market, put a sell stop with a buy back that sell, I don't know, about a half a point below that. Payroll was so bananas that almost within you know seconds, his buy stop got triggered on the upside and got filled above the level that he sold. And his sell stop got triggered on the downside and got filled below the level that he bought. <laughs> and that, that absolutely did happen. Um, and I had to tell him, I said, because the, the, the stops were in the system, as it were, uh, and the screen just showed a blank for a while, whilst the data of the exchange was just coming up with the point of the sell. And I could tell him, I know you're filled on all these orders. And what are the levels? I do not know the levels of the stops. <laughs> and when we revealed the level of the stops to be, to be basically, um, essentially, uh, worse than the... Uh, the initiation price of the trade. Yeah, that was a difficult conversation, but a real eye opener that those things can happen. You know what, Mark? You know, hearing that, it's really interesting because that, that has, apart from obviously the, the, the systematic implications of, yeah. of doing that, if you're using a systematic model, that has implications for trading and application of analysis. You yes, know, whether exactly. it's technical, whether it's fundamental, and, you know, we're not just talking about price level, but you know, one of the challenges of using analysis is this idea that something should happen, but then in the markets and the real world, it doesn't happen the way it should. And we yeah. see that with fundamental analysis as well. Um, and, you know, Clive, I'd love to put that to you, you know, where you, you, you have a very solid fundamental rationale for something that should happen, but then it doesn't happen the way it says on the tin, if you know what I mean. I mean, it th th things never happen the way, <laughs> the way it's fundamental. I mean, this is one of the hardest things about trying to do a kind of macro fundamental kind of view, have a macro fundamental view. You know, normally it, don't, it never plays out the way you expect. Um, I mean, you know, a, a, a trivial example, which I think most people will be able to understand is, you know, if you get uh, a, a, num a yeah, payroll number, as we talked about it, that's better than better than the previous one, but lower than what's expected. You know, it's it's good data. It's better data than the previous set of data. But because it's not as good as what people have been expecting, the market goes the opposite direction. You know, and that's a that's a, a, a an early lesson to learn. It's all about expectations rather than rather than whether the data is good or bad. It's better than expected or worse than expected. Really, that's the key key metric which you need to be looking at. Um, and I think generally, you know, when you look at how things play, how things should play out, again, you know, another, um, we, we always used to, we built one of the first kind of um, models that would actually automatically trade on, on data. Uh, and right. this is probably back around, around that kind of early, early teens, you know, 2013, 2014. Um, and we, we literally did it on data. So we do it on like payroll data. So we'd say, we basically say if the expectation was 200K, then if it's above 250, buy. If it's below 150, sell. And if it's within 150, 250, do nothing. But, you know, in that scenario, you'll, you'll get it doing something. And, and we, we'd also put parameters of, 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 of here's the initial price going into it. Don't do anything if it's if you can't do anything within half a percent, so whatever, you know. So we didn't want it buying two big figures away when that was too much of a move. Um, and... Uh, and really, and the problem is that you, you get the headline number, but you also get revisions on the previous numbers. 
and if there's a big revision, that can obviously uh, effectively add, add. You can almost add revisions to the to, to the to the date to the new number, um, and kind of come up with a, with a kind of uh, first order kind of is it good or is it bad? Uh, and if you ignore the, the the revisions, then you're not looking at everything there. And so I'll, you know this thing would sometimes yeah one time out of three it would do nothing. One time out of three it would get it right. One time out of three it would react as we taught it to, but it, it would then get it, it would be the wrong decision. And sometimes markets have an initial reaction one direction and then just completely reverse that. I mean, we, I saw that so many times when you would think that this should be positive for the dollar, for example, and the dollar would go up by half percent, one percent immediately afterwards, and then would actually retrace and then and close the day lower, even though the data had been pointing for a higher dollar. You know, everything in your fundamental view tells you the dollar should be higher today, but because of other factors it, it isn't and those other factors are often um uh, you can't see what they are it's almost like poker where you can't see other people's hands you know um you know there's there's it that you can only trade off the information that you have um but there's a lot of information out there that you don't have you know there may be a massive trade that someone's trying to you know sell dollars that day and they've used that opportunity to do it and that's bigger than all the buyers who bought from you know the macro reasons you know um so so it- it's interesting because, I mean, obviously you're someone who both writes uh, uh, some analysis and also uses it. What have you, have you learned anything about analysis as a trader from writing it and seeing what other people want from that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've been writing kind of commentaries and views for most of my career. You know, we write a morning commentary every day, which would go out. It'd be, you know, read by you know, you know, probably 500 people or whatever would, would actually be, you can see who's actually read it rather than just received it and not opened it. Um, you know, and so I've been writing my views and kind of a brief a brief thing about why I think this is going to happen. You would get interesting feedback. And I think this is um, from someone who, who kind of comes up with ideas and tries to uh, enumerate those and put them into, you know, kind of actionable things that people can do. Um you know, it's, it's always interesting to hear counterpoints and people, you know, kind of argue with you, uh, as long as it's, you know, done in a, in a, in a, you know, a, 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 a professional way, as it were. Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the, uh, again, this is one of the key lessons you need to learn, is to listen to people that disagree with you, because you come up with, with all, you can always find people to agree with you. That's really easy when you come up with anything, any idea uh, or theory on, you know, stock markets or financial markets in general. Um, but listening to the ideas that, that go counter to that, because that can give you a critical uh, way of questioning your own your own conviction. Um, and I think sometimes and this is why you know when you're around other traders, kind of doing things, having a kind of kind of the, the, the general chatter about ideas and views is is really healthy. And that's something that's really hard to do in isolation on your own. And you know, writing about things, you know, I'm writing. You know, kind of some a bit more detail now. I'd write like a deep monthly deep dive into a topic, um, and you know, so for example, I, I wrote about the new Bank of Japan governor, and um, you know about what I thought that the implications were for the yen. Um, and this is something where you know we we kind of knew he was going to be the governor in February. He was appointed in March, but his first meeting wasn't till April uh, this year. So you know, there was it's kind of playing out over months. So you know, you can come up with a kind of theory and my 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 kind of basis was that it probably would be bad for the yen and good for dollar yen so um or euro yen uh, and that was my kind of idea on the back of it but actually positioning for that and putting that trade on you know you don't you don't just read the article and say okay i'll go out and buy dollar yen there because you know with it, you know you need to then then you go to kind of like well where do i put this trade on what's the tactics around that what's the strategy and that's where you then look at price action, you look at the charts, you look at this kind of stuff. And I think, you know, from the, the macro stuff, most macro ideas are are played out over days or weeks. And so the entry level is is probably more important than your, your uh, at least as important as your exit level. You need to have an idea of, okay, within that, what's my, what's my price target? How much do I think this is going to move? What's the right strategy here? And there's a lot of times when you come up with a piece of macro analysis and you never actually get onto the trade because it doesn't get to yeah. your entry level. It doesn't get to the point where you think it offers good value. Um, yeah. And I would say that's that's another thing. I Probably half of my ideas don't end up with actual positions. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's a really interesting point because it's something which I think every trader will recognise whether they're new or whether they're experienced and senior. That that idea that you 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 get a feel for where the market's going, but you don't always get a chance to put your idea on because you, you know you the market just gets ahead of you sometimes. And then on another occasion, you get it on, but the market's not ready for you and it falls away. And, you know, you, you end up with the pain and sometimes you're forced out of the position before the idea you had starts to really take hold and take root. And that, that's why it's particularly hard, you know, when, when it goes against you, you're almost more convinced now it's at a better entry level. <laughs> yeah. And, but one, one of the things that occurred to me as you were talking there and about this idea of, you know, it, it's so important to be around other people. And I think, you know, I, I, sp I spoke with our guest at the last um, uh, last podcast. He was a day trader who's just written a book called Cash Rules, Reminiscences of a Day Trader. And, and we were talking at the end of it about the importance of being around other people. And, and a lot of people these days don't want to trade with other people. They trade at home or they, they want to trade on their own. Um, but also, I think there's a feeling that it's a lot cheaper to do it that way. It's a lot more economical. Your setup's easy. You don't have to pay desk hire, room hire, which can run into into thousands every year. So, so on the face of it, it appears a lot cheaper to do it that way. But you lose so much that you would get from being around other people. Um, I, I think a, a lot of people who started in propriety trading offices or, or you know, if you'd never experienced that first day uh, in a trading room with non-farm payrolls, you may not have become the person you became and got sort of intoxicated in that moment. Um, and, and I know, you know, you were at Bankers Trust. I mean, Bankers was a, a beast of a bank back in the 90s. It was probably the best trading bank um, and was a breeding ground for some brilliant traders, uh, quite a few of, of who are still around today. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's it's something where uh, you know I know a lot of people that do will do like courses on trading and stuff like that. And I think for me, the value on those potentially is kind of almost the community aspect. You're seeing other people going through the same thing, and you can kind of even if it's not in person, you can kind of maybe have chats open with these other guys that are going through the same thing, and that might give you a bit of you know a bouncing board for ideas and you know sharing experiences because i think as well you, you can often think i must be doing this wrong you know, I, I, you know i'm losing money or whatever and seeing other people do the same thing or making some of the same mistakes you know uh is, is a useful teaching ground i mean it's a lot cheaper if someone else makes a mistake and you learn from it than you do it yourself oh yeah well 100 percent. but there's also that shared learning aspect that social yeah, yeah. social learning aspect yeah okay a question again I wanted to put to you, and, and I'm conscious that we've we've probably getting towards the end of this, but it, it sounds like you synthesise lots of different forms of analysis in your work. It, it, would that be correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I I I look at all sorts of all sorts of things, and really, it's it's as a go back to what I said earlier on. That's what works for you, um, and I think you know I I, I look at a lot of things. Um, as much to question an idea I have, you know, I'll often come up with the idea first, you know, and then uh, read a lot of you know, contrasting viewpoints to, to kind of, uh, kind of uh, test that idea out to see if it's if it's rigorous enough and is worth uh, is worth doing, uh, worth following. Uh, and then you look at all sorts of the other analysis to do it. And I think um, actual. Um, you know, look at technicals or RSIs and this kind of stuff is, is a useful um, useful thing to, to do. But it's it's hard to sort of come up with my method and say, this is exactly what I do. And I'd say I do different things every single time. Um, yeah. I think that's the, the other thing, which is you know, hard to then encapsulate, you know, because it's never the same. Sure, sure. I mean, it's, it, it is interesting because that, that comes back to the idea of, um you, you said earlier on that it, it's so hard to teach this because everyone looks at it from from a different perspective a different angle um their own experiences um so so how 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 do you tell how do you tell someone what the right and wrong way is um 
and, and again, if I look back on my own experience, you know, I, I don't think I would ever say that I had one, you know, overriding um, approach. I, I'd say probably the one thing is that I would sometimes feel something is right at a certain point, having gone down lots of dead ends. I mean, sometimes you just do have a feeling, oh, this is, this is, I think it's, it, it becomes when, when you get the confirmation, when a trade starts going right, you kind of feel, feel it's going right. And also when it's going wrong, you know, sometimes you, you kind of trade on immediately, is it, you know, your face and, you know, you just get a feeling, this is, I've, I, I need to be getting out of this, you know, I might, I know my stop loss might be here, but it just doesn't feel right, you know? Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's just, I think in a way that's, that's your mind telling you, there's something you've missed here. There's something you've missed here. You might not be able to put it down again into words what, what, what the rule you've broken is, but you know, there's something that's just not right. Your mind's telling you, but you know, you can't quite encapsulate it into one one reason. So that, that that's intuition. Yeah, effectively, yeah. <laughs> and, and again, I think, you know, bringing up the fact that you're a mathematician, I think mathematicians are historically very good at that. You know, that they, they, they kind of look beneath the surface or you, I think you're almost taught to look beneath the surface yeah I, mean, I think you know I find a kind of um, I've always had an affinity to numbers and kind of numbers kind of seem to me mean more to me than 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 just just a, a tool you know you always get a feeling from numbers um, yep. it, it's funny I used to um, when I was like 16 years old I used to do like cold calling to sell double glazing which is <laughs> Something doesn't really happen much nowadays, but uh, we literally tear a page out of the phone book and start, you know, reading every number on the thing. I remember, you know, some people will, will recognise faces or names or words or pictures or smells. You know, I recognise numbers. You know, there'd, there'd be a thing where I go down the page and I just start dialing a number and go, "I've dialed this number before." You know, it'd be one because we had a couple of phone books, and, and you know, I'm, this is just a random string of numbers, really. You know, but. I, I can still tell you phone num- every phone number I've ever had. You know, I kind of remember things by numbers rather than by anything else. That's probably one of the key things. So I kind of feel numbers a bit more, probably more, and get a sense that this is this is I've I've seen that number before. Or I this number is a good number or bad number. You know, it's almost like the numbers speak to me more than just more than just being a uh, you know a number on the screen. It's it, there's meaning behind that. Interesting how we all think differently driven by different things. Sometimes we have conversations and we understand we don't, why we don't understand each other. It's because our, our background language is different and our perspective that we bring to the table is, is often very, very different. And uh, we can confuse each other by not realizing that actually, you know, I'm seeing that number as a cloud and you're seeing it as, a, as part of a ladder and that person there sees it as part of a spiral. Um, very, very interesting to bring these perspectives together. And of course, making sense of the market is always going to be a challenge and we almost must we must learn from the experience of it if we're going to have any chance and you know we've, we've certainly not stopped learning ourselves wonderful so Stephen yeah no it's been great Clive could you tell us obviously how people can find out more about you and your work and um, header yeah so I'm I'm, I'm basically writing a, a month or Weekly, weekly commentaries on on FX markets and what's interesting and what I'm what I'm looking at, uh, and I'll do like a monthly uh, we call it deep dive where I really go really deep into a topic and analyze it. Um, I touched on I, I talked about the new Bank of Japan governor and the impact on the yen. Um, I've been also doing things like going into gold and how central banks are using gold and you know the impact of de dollarization on things like that. Uh, and uh, debt ceiling is uh, the latest thing which I'm talking about. You know, the impact on, not so much on the politics behind it, but on the impact on the dollar and how it's going to affect financial markets. You know, this kind of, uh, these kind of factors are giving people giving people trade ideas they can use and they can find me at uh, currency.header.com um, and there's, you know, there's various things you can uh, look at some of the articles I've written and uh, uh, have a free trial and stuff like that and uh, read some of my stuff if you like it. You know, you can dig in, get get some more. But it's it's, it's good. I, I really like. There's a community behind it as well, where people are asking questions, and we we you know, talk to people about that. And there's a there's a dialogue between people. It's not just me sitting in a room and uh, you know writing something and then just switching the computer off and ignoring everybody. You know, there's a dialogue behind that. You know, and 
And again, I find it useful when people challenge my views. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's a good thing to, to, to test your own theories. I'm, I'm putting on trades myself, you know, uh, yep. I'm talking about the trades I've got on and uh, the levels and where I'm taking profit or putting my stocks and things like that. So maybe other people can follow that and we use it, use it as a information. I think the way I like to describe it is I'm talking about like tidal forces in the markets, you know, the tidal rise and it'll bring things with it. You know, it's not something which you can immediately action on day one when you read the article, but it's something you should have in the back of your mind and then it can shape your trading if you're involved in those markets. Um, it's something, something which anyone that's trading those markets can can use and be aware of and will find it useful, I hope. Thank you. That's, I mean, that's brilliant. And, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because I, you know, I think we get a, We've got a fair old mix amongst our audience. We've got a lot of uh, retail trade trader clients on there. We've got quite a few new clients, people new to trading, who are early in their learning journey. Then we've got some sort of more experienced institutional types, um, investment banks, hedge funds, and, and so, some family offices we have on there as well, and asset managers. So we have a, a, a real eclectic mix. Um, and it, it, some, something's come up for me that I just wanted to perhaps just ask you before um, we leave this conversation, because I'm, I'm mindful that if someone puts, I, I don't know if you're on social media, but if someone puts an idea on social media, it often gets, <laughs> it gets beaten up in about the next 20 tweets, tweets from people who don't agree and they try and shut you down and they, they try and close you down because that doesn't suit their view or their worldview. And, and you, you've said so much about the importance of actually being open to challenge um, and allowing a good form to view. And I think that's one of the things that's often missing from the discourse on social media. Um, how, how, do you have any thoughts about that? And, and, and have you ever experienced that at all? Um, I mean, it's... <laughs> I've definitely experienced being being challenged by a lot of people who disagree with my viewpoint, and you know you have to uh, uh, take that on board. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting you bring up social media and you get a lot of pylons and and you know a lot of people with the same view all kind of you know, kind of go and say the same thing. I think you know there's a lot of noise there you need to um, kind of tune out to some extent because um, I think the the space where this is probably the worst is the crypto space. Because there's an yep. awful lot of people who are very, you know, almost um, uh, evangelical about it, and it's, it becomes a, a tribal thing. You know, you can't question the 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 the, the legitimacy of this, or you know, the view. You can't question the view. Um, and I think that's where, as a as a trader, I have no particular uh, affinity for any one product or whatever. And you know, you know when you're when you're buying you know, any trade I'm doing, you're buying something and selling something else. So it's always a relative viewpoint on something. I think that's something which um, you can even apply to stocks. You know, when you're buying stocks, you're selling your currency to do that, you know. And often when you have a kind of, um, you know, when there's like an inflationary viewpoint or whatever, sometimes just buying stocks is an inflation hedge, you know, just purely on a, it's not dollars or pounds or you know, euros or whatever it is your base currency is. Um, and you need to be thinking about that. It's not just, uh, it's not just that. I think that's what FX teaches you. It's always something relative to another. But, you know, in terms of um, social media can be quite toxic in that you do get a lot of noise. I think Twitter particularly, because it's kind of a free-for-all. Having some kind of curated comments uh, is slightly better. You know, different forms like Reddit and things like that. You know, you know people do ask me anything, things on Reddit. And it, it can be quite... I think it's slightly better than, than than Twitter, but you know, if everyone's saying the same thing, it may just be because someone's got all their friends to say, or people with like-minded views to kind of come and come and pile onto you. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily a healthy thing to take. Um, I think it's better to. What I was saying about reading people who have different views, about reading other people's ideas, and a Twitter comment is not necessarily someone coming up with a different idea. It's someone just yeah. having a go sometimes. Yeah. And I'm I, th I think we we forget that sometimes though or people forget that in those moments you, you need to be hard though you need to be able to, you need to be able to either ignore it or defend yourself you know and it's sometimes yeah. a futile act to try and defend yourself when there's lots of people shouting at you but <laughs> well, sometimes think, you just need to ignore it and that's the best thing to do 
I, I think if you're going to survive the world of trading, you need to have that kind of coat of armor anyway. Yes, um, yes, very much. So it, it probably filters out uh, the, that side of people anyway, as it is. Okay, listen, this has been great, Clive. Um, Mark, any final thoughts? I think it's a, <clears throat> it's, it's a lesson, really, I guess, the, the translation of a personal passion in mathematics translating into something into that's viable as a platform to launch yourself into markets um, is, 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 a, is a good message, I think. Uh, I know there was a big drive, certainly from government to get people more involved in, in mathematics. And but when my youngest son needed some maths tuition, we, we knew a maths professor that we sent him to. I don't know, the stuff he was coming back with, even as a young kid, I'm thinking, we didn't talk this stuff at school, you know, about these patterns and these formulas and these shortcuts. Um, I imagine that there's, there's great joy in being able to use something that seems such an almost like a stiff type subject. And to turn it into something that drives a career is is very very rewarding so i think it's it's great to have shared that story clive um and to i suppose to encourage others that as well as learning about markets you know just learn about the more fundamental things of pricing which actually stems from mathematics because you might find some um, things there that uh, will help to drive your models and to drive your thinking behind how to you know try to make market try, try to make money in this ever diff, difficult sphere called markets so it's very interesting Clive and, and, and I think we're really grateful for you sharing that story with us thank you for listening today we would like to thank our podcast sponsorship partners Society of Technical Analysts ESTA you can find out more about our sponsors on our website alpha-mind.net or see the link in the episode description the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, provide well-beating technical analysis education programs. Alphamon podcast listeners can obtain a discount off the cost of their excellent home study course. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, we'd appreciate it if you could leave a friendly review or provide a rating for the show on whichever podcast service you use. You can find out more about us on our website, alpha-mind.net. You can follow us on Twitter at alphamind101 and at alphamind102. And you can connect with me, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall on LinkedIn. You can also follow us and can check back over some of our past episodes on the alphamindpodcast.com. We wish you the best of luck in the markets. Have a good week.